welcome everyone to the uh, AO uh, Journal Club. Uh, my name is John Hagedorn, and um, we're going to be talking about geriatric pertrochanteric fractures tonight. Um, I have a great group of moderators, uh, Nicholas uh, Romeo, who's my co-chair, as well as Jillian uh, Kaisley, uh, who conducted the interviews and put in a lot of great work for tonight with our faculty authors, uh, who include uh, uh, Brandon Ewan, uh, Dr. Drew Sanders, and Dr. Roy Sanders. Uh, here are the disclosures for all of the moderators and faculty involved. And uh, this is just uh, information about the disclosures uh, for you all to read. Uh, this is a content statement from AO North America uh, specifying that uh, we are a nonprofit uh, circle specialty society dedicated to improving the care of patients with skeletal injuries, and that we're not promoting any particular product or service and uh, that anything talked about tonight is for demonstration and teaching purposes. Uh, even though we're all uh, very used to Zoom, there's some Zoom etiquette before we get off uh, tonight. All the microphones have been muted. The video cameras are turned off uh, by our staff. Uh, if you have questions or any technical issues, please uh, submit those to the QA box and we'll either address the technical issue or answer the question. Uh, uh, and that will occur by moderators reviewing these questions. And uh, there's a chat box for faculty and staff as a reminder. Here's our agenda for the evening. So we're going to start off to welcome, watch three videos, and then around 8.45 or so, have a uh, robust, robust discussion session with the moderators as well as the uh, faculty authors. Here's kind of the goal for these monthly journal club sessions. And upon completion of this, uh, we hope that uh, everyone's gonna be able to list implant considerations with pertrochanteric femur fractures, recall concerns and limitations of short and long nails when treating pertrochanteric uh, femur fractures, recognize the advantages of two screws when fixing uh, the pertrochanteric femur fracture, and finally describe the benefits of nail diameter in the fixation of pertrochanteric femur fractures. Uh, there are more journal clubs to come. Uh, so January, February, March journal club dates and topics are listed to the right. Uh, and we're also excited to announce that the uh, committee uh, spent some great time over at Davos uh, doing similar interviews as you're going to see tonight with great international faculty who wrote great articles. And uh, I encourage you all to look uh, for announcements from the AO in the future in 2023 for this invaluable opportunity uh, to hear uh, directly from the authors on some international papers as well. So uh, thank you everyone for coming out. Uh, if you missed part of the recording, you'll be able to see it tonight. And I'd like to, before we get started, thank the staff, Chris, Beth, and April for helping us get this together. So with that, Chris, uh, you can get the videos going. All right, welcome everybody. And uh, now we're going to discuss short versus long nails used for uh, peritroke hip fractures. Um, with us is Dr. Ewan um, from Mayo Clinic. I'm Dr. Kaisley. We're coming out of Leahy. And we're going to start with a little bit of an intro. Perfect. Yeah, thanks, Jillian. So um, this is a, a study that we completed a few years ago. Um, the uh, study was a randomized prospective study of patients with intertrochanteric fractures, and they uh, we were randomizing them to short or long cephalomedullary nails. We originally recruited over about four years, about 220 patients. We lost about 50 or so due to mainly primarily due to actually mortality at rate at three months, and then a few more that dropped out for other reasons, and ended up with 80 that got short nails and 88 that got randomized to long nails. And the primary conclusion that we got from the study. Um, was that there was not a significant clinical difference in the functional outcome scores between the patients that got short and long nails in the group, and that the short nail patients um, had a shorter hospital length of stay, shorter operative times, and less EVL. Awesome. awesome. And then let's go a little bit into the discussion here. So what was the first kind of motivator for doing this study? Yeah, that's a good question. So at that time, there wasn't any other prospective data looking at comparing short and long nails. The data that was out there was retrospective, and all of the retrospective data you can imagine for looking at this question is prone to selection bias, meaning that all of the patients that had relatively simple intertrochanteric fractures were getting treated by select, you know, surgeon selection with a short, relative, a short nail, 
and the ones that were relatively more unstable were getting treated with a long nail. So anytime you went back and looked at a cohort of those types of patients, there would be some you know, risk of selection bias and the patients treated with a short nail would be maybe having a you know, less rate of cutout or they would have be a better functional outcome or they'd have less hospital stay or what have you. Maybe, be, maybe because it was a short nail, maybe because they were right. the more simple fractures that had been selected for that treatment. Right. Um, and there's discussion methodology. Um, as you said, you know, you're able to pull off a prospective study. And so with randomizing these cases, were there any challenges in that? Yeah, for sure. I mean, we had um, some patients that just didn't want to be in the study for, you know, reasons not, of not wanting to be in prospective research. But the main thing that was uh, the a, a limitation was the exclusion criteria. One of them we set a priori was that the sub amount of subtrochan extension needed to be less than three centimeters. And you can imagine that determining the amount of subtrochan extension on the initial injury x-rays is not always reliable. And we even did have a few patients in the study that we measured the amount of subtrochan extension on their injury films took them to the operating room, they randomized them and consented them, took them to the operating room. And then once you pulled traction on it, then you could see, oh, that was actually a little bit more than three centimeters of subtrochic extension. And so those patients were included in the study too. It was a small number, but there were some in there that had that. And there's not really, a, as you can imagine, a great way to determine that exact amount of subtrochic extension for a research study like this before the patient is enrolled in, and anesthetized and off to sleep to pull, really pull on it and determine how much subtrochic extension there was. Absolutely. So um, look at that. So you know, we talked about some of the strengths of the study and one of them being the prospective aspect of it. And as you mentioned, um, all the previous data had been retrospective. Um, can you speak to any, uh, the other strengths aspect of this study? Yeah, that's perfect. So the, I mean, the other thing was, is that, uh, and this is important to realize about the study is that it was powered primarily for functional outcomes. So we did have patient reported data as one of the outcomes for the for the study, SF36 scores and Harris HIP scores, and um, found that they was, the functional outcomes were similar between the groups. We did collect a lot of other data that might be av of use as well, um, including the rate of distal fracture, which everybody is curious about, and right. the rate of cutout and mechanical failure. Um, but the it, important thing to remember about this study is that it was not powered to look at that specifically, meaning the rate of distal right. fracture. Right. And I think, um, you know, going along with the, the limitations of it is that, you know, obviously, although it isn't um, powered for, you know, it's powered toward functional outcomes, as you've mentioned, is that, um, <clears throat> you know, there's been changes in nail design, advances in nail design that have maybe allowed um, these perioperative fractures that people were worried about with the original nails, where, the, where there was a much higher number of peri-implant fractures. Um, that number is not as high. Uh, which is good as it's not as high, but also makes it so that the number needed to enroll into a study to truly know the difference between long and short uh, would be much higher. Yes. Uh, yeah, that's perfect. I'm glad you brought that up because um, so the rate of, of distal fracture that we saw around the short nails was relatively low as two patients out of 80, you know, so a little over uh, 3% or something like that. And it was the same for the for the long nails in the study. Now we did look at it recently again, and since the conclusion of enrollment, we did have an additional patient that was in the study that had a short nail and had a fracture below that too. So it's three instead of two out of out of eighty. But the okay. um, the limitation part there is primarily if you wanted to do a study with that rate of that complication, if you wanted to do a study, a randomized prospective study to look at a to detect a difference in the rate of distal fracture, you'd have to have almost 10 times as many patients enrolled in the study to power the study right. appropriately. And for a single center, you know, randomized trial like we were doing, that just wasn't feasible to get that many patients in there. So we didn't, the one thing you cannot say from this study is that the rate of distal fracture is the same between short and long nails. It was similar in the small cohort we had, but the study was not powered for that particular difference. Right. Um, and then in, in practice now, any characteristics that then push you um, toward a long nail? If, you're, if your default is a short nail for intertroch fractures, what's pushing you toward using a long nail? Yeah, that's a good question. So um, there's a couple of things. I think you have to think about how stable your short nail is going to be in that proximal segment when you pot it down into it and put a single interlock in the distal part of it. So for instance, the uh, femur that is 
very wide and patchless uh, that the short nail is gonna get really essentially no endosteal fit in. I worry about the stability of that fracture treated with a short nail, regardless of the inherent stability or instability of the intertrochanteric pattern. So those ones with really wide femurs, I tend to just put a long nail in. You know, the long nail in that one is probably still not getting isthmal fit because their isthmus is, you know, still bigger than 15 millimeters or whatever, but right. got to be better than a short nail with a single interlock in it. The other one that I think about too is, you know, there's three centimeters of subtrach extension and then there's three centimeters of subtrach extension. So it's not always yeah. the same. Uh, you can have three centimeters subtrach extension on the medial side where the, where the, you know, the posterior medial fragment of the lesser trochanter is. And that one I think is probably a little less affected than if you have three centimeters of subtrach extension on the lateral side of the femur or down from the vastus tubercle. The other thing about those ones is that often then the, um, a reverse oblique pattern or trans pattern like that, the insertion point of the lag screw is also going to be on the proximal fragment or in a separate greater trochanteric fragment. It's not the same piece of bone that the nail is potted into. It's not the same piece of bone that the distal interlock is going in. So those ones, I think, have more inherent instability. And even if it's, you know, three or two or uh, centimeters of subtrach extension on that lateral side, I'm still more likely to use a long nail for that one. Perfect. All right. And then uh, just to wrap it up here. So some of our take home points is that from your study, we can conclude that there was no clinical or functional differences in using short versus long nails. Uh, short versus long nails had similar complications and profiles as um, set through our limitations that we said before. Um, short nails, the advantage of this paper, it also looks not only is it prospective, but it's also including those uh, with subtroke extension, which on a lot of the random, on all of the retrospective studies uh, may have been filtered out and would have gotten a, a long nail by default. Um, <clears throat> one of the things um, we didn't discuss specifically, but the, the most important, the, there was a handful that did cut out and the, of those, it was it's still the tip to apex distance rather than the nail being long or short. That was a better predictor of failure rather than the, the size of the nail itself. And then with our perioperative fractures, uh, all the ones that uh, happened uh, within the study were all due to trauma, um, not iatrogenic. So uh, in the words of one of my mentors, the best way to prevent fractures is uh, don't fall, don't fall, don't fall. So still think that's a good guideline to go for our uh, hip fractured patients. Um, <clears throat> with that, we'll uh, conclude this session and we'll get on with the, uh, the next discussion. Thank you. Perfect, thanks. Welcome everyone to the AO Journal Club. Uh, pleasure to be joined tonight by Drew Sanders from the University of Texas uh, Southwest in Dallas. Uh, thanks for coming out tonight, uh, Dr. Sanders. Thanks for having me. And um, we're going to be talking tonight about your paper, uh, Does Size Matter for Cephalomedullary Nails and Geriatric Intertrochanteric Hip Fractures? It was in the JOT. And if you wouldn't mind, just give us uh, about 30, 40 seconds about what the conclusions from your study were. Yeah, so we just we looked at a big group of patients taken care of at our place uh, over about a 10 year period. And really, we were interested in knowing, does the diameter of the cephalomedullary nail make a difference uh, in whether these heal or not or go on to non-union or have some sort of mechanical complication? And we looked at about about 170 patients, uh, roughly half and half size 10 diameter nails and then uh, other than 10 millimeter nails. And the conclusion was they do they do equivalent. Uh, they fail at low rates in general. Uh, there doesn't seem to be any difference between nails that were 10 millimeters in diameter and nails that were greater than 10 millimeters in diameter. So I think it it kind of holds true that fractures with a good reduction and sensible implant placement heal well with a low complication rate. It doesn't really matter what diameter nail you use. Okay, thank you for that. So was there a particular problem or event that kind of led you to doing this study? Uh, not a particular event, but I think uh, certainly part of it was in fellowship. And I know one of our other faculty members, Dr. Roy Sanders, he's published, you know, some about this issue. Uh, how many devices do you keep on the shelf? Um, you, you know, hospital shelf space is uh, infinitely valuable and uh, you're trying to bring value to the healthcare system. So if you can do a good job uh, without a huge inf inventory of implants, maybe that benefits everybody, uh, benefits the hospital system, benefits the surgeons. Uh, and so that was kind of the inspiration for it, looking at some other studies that have been done previously. Mentioned in the study that you had to divide the groups into the 10 millimeter nail group 
and everything greater than 10 because you couldn't compare the tens to individual nail sizes that were greater. So um, one question that I had was why do you think that 10 millimeter nail group was so large in the study to begin with um, and everything else was so small? It's a, it's a really good question. I, I don't know that we have a perfect answer for that. Like uh, the the good parts of the study, uh, all the cases were done by a lot of different surgeons over a long period of time. So I think it, it involved different habits and different practices. There's probably some people who just reflexively grab the smallest nail off the shelf. Some people probably ream the diaphysis kind of like you would a diaphyseal fracture and go for fit of the nail. Uh, so I don't, I don't know if there's a lot of rhyme or reason behind the different size groupings, um, but we just took what we had and, and made the best comparison we could. You completed this study. Was there any impact on your clinical practice? I wouldn't say I changed. I think this, to me, this was kind of validating something that I already believed. Uh, you know, I think uh, luckily I was taught to focus on the reduction and screw placement, tip apex distance, things like that. Not so much importance was given to the diameter of the nail or even necessarily the length of the nail. So I think just this validated something that I already believed and I already did for the most part. Uh, but I do think it's changed the behavior of probably some of my partners who are a little more experienced than I am. I think they've they've come around to believe that this is probably the case. So, and that was going to be my next question. It seems like your partners have changed, but have you had any uh, at the OTA or other uh, meetings had comments about this study or people approach you about how it's impacted their practice? Um, I think I've seen not necessarily at the OTA, but uh, on, the, on the web, you know, if you go to JOT's website you can look at different comments, people tweet about articles uh, and they communicate in digital, digital fashion. I think a lot of people agree that this is, this is probably a truism that they can stick to. Um, so I haven't had a lot of naysayers, so that's good. Uh, but I've had a lot of people agree with the concept behind it. You have an indication or situation where a larger diameter nail would be used in your practice? It's a really interesting question. I, I try to think of that as well. Um, I, I can't really think of one off the top of my head. It would have to be some really exceptional circumstance, a really atypical femur, something like that, uh, where you're seeking greater stability. Um, you know, part of the reason we, we kept the study pretty clean, we kept it to to uh, really just intertrope fractures. We tried to avoid anything with subtrope extension, you know, just, just looking at relatively simple fractures. So um, I can't really think of a scenario off the top of my head where you need more than a 10 millimeter nail, you know, when you're talking about these relatively stable-ish fracture patterns. So do you think, uh, just speaking off the cuff, that something like a nine millimeter nail would achieve similar results? Ooh, that's an interesting question. Uh, I think I think it probably would. Um, you know, all these all these nails, the commonality, they have that huge proximal body, they have big lag screws. I think the diaphyseal portion of the nail um, probably doesn't matter that much. You know, it's just a place to hold an interlocking bolt. I'm sure there's some diameter you get to where it just wouldn't work, um, but maybe a nine would work uh, as long as it had a big proximal body. If you could comment, uh, you had both long and short nails in the study, mm -hmm. and uh, you mentioned in your conclusion and discussion that your study confirmed a lot of other studies done by Clono and other physicians. Um, wh why did you choose to include both both of those in this study? Uh, I think a couple of reasons. Number one, again, looking at the practice patterns, like I can point to some of the more senior docs that work where I do who are believers in long nails all day. Uh, and so they were they were part of the group that was included in the cohort. And I can look at myself and one or two people uh, that are my age or younger. And we've probably come to believe the results of those other studies that for stable patterns, short versus long doesn't seem to make a difference in reoperation, union, things like that. Um, so, you know, it, part of it was believing that for the right fracture, long versus short doesn't matter. Um, but also I think to, to help us achieve enough power, uh, to include, uh, enough of those cases to show, uh, whether the diameter really had anything to do with the outcome. Is there a conclusion of this study that maybe isn't written that you want the audience to know? Ooh, that's a good question. I think, uh, 
maybe the one thing, it's something we all fall back on. It's probably back to Baumgartner's original paper uh, that with good reduction and central screw placement, you're going to have success. Uh, as long as you choose the right style implant for your fracture, as long as you obey those other principles, you're probably going to be successful. Um, you know, whether you're a long nail, short nail, single screw, dual screw, you know, if you obey those other principles, you're probably going to do well. Anything you do differently with uh, the study now that it's been published and out? I think, yeah, when you, when you look at it, you wonder, because we had to aggregate the bigger nail diameters, if we had bigger groups of those, um, you know, if we had a lot of 11.5 nails, if we had a lot of 13 nails, could we analyze those groups by themselves? That might be interesting. Uh, and then always, you know, it's retrospective. So if you could do this in a prospective fashion, it'd probably be more powerful. Uh, I think the result would probably be the same, to be honest. Uh, but I think it would make it a stronger study if those uh, other other than 10 millimeter groups were bigger and if you could do it in a prospective fashion. What point would you want readers to take away? Uh, I'd like the readers to take away from this that it's not necessarily the diameter of the implant that makes a difference in the outcome of the fracture. You know, our, our study shows that different diameters can all work. It's the other factors that have been identified by previous authors and maybe confirmed in our study that really matter. If you have a, a good quality reduction, deep and central placement of your screw fixation, you're going to have a successful outcome of the case and for your patient. So the diameter thing is an interesting question, but I think it, it builds upon the work of previous authors and it confirms some of their findings. Um, any future studies or directions that this could be taken um, by other surgeons or yourself? Yeah, I wonder, you know, this is, uh, I wonder if you could show that you save, you save the hospital system money over time, you know, reduce inventory. I think maybe that's the other takeaway from this paper, kind of like we talked about at the beginning. If you can convince your surgeons that you need fewer implants on the shelf, uh, maybe you can bring more value to your hospital system uh, by having to stock left, fewer implants, things like that. Okay, hi everyone. I'm Nick Romeo uh, from Cleveland, Ohio, here with Dr. Roy Sanders from Tampa. Uh, we'll be discussing, discussing his group's 2017 clinical article comparing a two-screw device to a single-screw device for geriatric pertrochip hip fractures. Additionally, uh, Dr. Sanders played a role in development of, of this particular implant device, so he has some extra insight for us regarding the implant. So thank you, Dr. Sanders, for being here with us today. Thank you for having me. Uh, the first question I would have is what prompted the development of this implant and, and subsequently the, the study itself? So, you know, uh, intertrope fractures uh, are really uh, considered uh, the unsolvable fracture when I was a resident uh, and uh, even throughout my uh, career. Uh, when you think about it, every fracture in the body, you're trying to fix anatomically, hold it out to length, stabilize it, maintain an anatomy. But yet somehow on this fracture, everybody accepted settling and collapse. And that's really because the technology was not available uh, to do that. And with uh, uh, single screw devices, uh, which are a big advantage over fixed angle devices like a blade plate, um, they allowed a lot of compression and collapse. Uh, generally, the idea was to get the patient out of bed, the geriatric patient with the intertroke, get them out of bed. Uh, but they couldn't uh, stop the shortening or the medialization of the uh, shaft. And uh, that was okay. That was uh, acceptable because it was an unsolved fracture. And uh, Dr. Tony Russell uh, and myself decided uh, to uh, tackle this particular fracture. After we uh, had come up with a whole bunch of different nailing uh, systems, we still had this as one of the uh, problematic uh, uh, fractures. And uh, just to be clear, uh, it took us eight years to come up with this uh, device and uh, uh, perfect it and then start using it clinically. So it's not like, you know, we just uh, did this. It was a lot of work. So I'm very biased, but even though some of you may know me for um, my calcaneal fracture classification and work, I'm most proud about this uh, device because it's really uh, changed the way uh, a lot of people who use this treat these fractures and it's, and it's made a difference in our patient population. So. Great. 
Uh, in the study, the two major radiographic factors that were, look, that were looked at were the shortening and varus collapse. Um, and the, the two screw device was clearly superior at all time points for both of those. Um, are there any additional measures or radiographic assessments that you would look at uh, or that you feel are important in following these patients? Well, when you, uh, when you use a, a, a hip screw device, whether it's a single uh, side plate, a single screw with a side plate or a single screw with a nail, um, when you're following them, what you're seeing is not, unless there's complete cutout uh, from axial load, what you're seeing is failure with rotation. And so the reason they settle is because as it rotates around that screw, even though the screw is locked in the nail or the side plate, the head can rotate around uh, that screw. And that causes erosion of the neck, allowing it to settle, which causes more erosion until at some point it heals, right? It's an extra capsule of fracture. So uh, when you uh, look at these, what, what happens is when it rolls off, uh, when you look at an AP X-ray, it looks like varus collapse, but mostly it's uh, rotation. And uh, so uh, we look at that, and when you see uh, it start to shift, then obviously there's going to be a problem. Now, uh, the way we put these devices in, you still want to put the screw, the lag screw center center, and then you want to be able to put the, the worm screw, in our case, below that. It can grab the calcar or it can fill, the, uh, fill that lower half. And that seems to give you the best resistance against rotation. But even, you know, with, with uh, the inner tan, if you go into the upper quadrant, upper anterior quadrant, uh, it doesn't have enough uh, material. Uh, not, no device has enough material to keep it from rotating off and cutting out. So. Uh, we And the way we do this, not everybody does this, but the way this device is designed and we use it uh, is that when we put the worm screw in, we get that uh, axial compression, right? We get direct compression. So there's no rotation when we, when we compress this. After the fracture is compressed, we use the uh, screw at the top. Uh, to actually lock it. And so when we compress that uh, upper uh, locking screw all the way down, now you have a compressed fixed angle device, so nothing moves. And so we obviously look to make sure that the fracture uh, has not shifted or the screws have not settled. They typically settle maybe a one or two millimeters, uh, but they really, the fracture just goes on to heal pretty rapidly. And we know that the fracture is stable because these people don't have any pain uh, post-op. I mean, they have surgical pain, but they're able to get up and walk uh, on day one. There are a lot of these people that are in their normally active osteopenic people that fail and break their hip. Uh, they get out of bed the next day, they're home the next day. Uh, and it's, it's pretty remarkable because it's shortened the time uh, that we've uh, um, uh, kept them in the hospital. Uh, and their get up and go uh, is a lot better. Uh, and when we see them in the office, they don't really have any change in their x-ray. If we see change in the x-ray, uh, that's a that would be a problem, obviously, because for us, we don't expect any any collapse, any change uh, in the post-operative period. Great, thanks. Uh, in the discussion the article uh, that you guys mentioned that there really aren't there really isn't any data to show how much shortening or collapse affects the patients clinically. Do you have a specific measure that you feel really makes a difference? And how much differently do you feel these patients do clinically compared to patients with a single screw device? Right. So the problem with a single screw device, uh, and, you know, obviously, if you have a completely non-displaced stable endotroke that you put a screw in, uh, and uh, it doesn't move, even if you use a single screw device or a DHS type device, uh, those people are going to do well. The people where they have a comminution uh, of the, uh, the subtroke, right, the lesser troke is off, or they have a three or four part fracture, <clears throat> or they have lateral escape, they're going to have an unstable pattern. Uh, and as a result of that, they're going to shorten quite significantly until they heal with a single screw device, if in fact they heal. So um, you'll see uh, that they actually, the shortening is not only shortening, but it medializes the shaft. And as a result of that, they end up with a pretty bad Trendelenburg. 
So I would say, you know, half an inch or when you see the, the, the screw back out, you know, 10, 12, 15, 20 millimeters, uh, not only does it bother them laterally, it's a real problem in terms of uh, the shortening. And even if you give them a lift, uh, they still are medialized. So they're still going to get that little bit of a Trendelenburg lurch. So that's obviously, we don't want that. We're mm -hmm. trying to fix the fracture anatomically. And for me, that's the greatest thing about this. This is an unsolved fracture that you can fix with this device and actually maintain the reduction that you get in the operating room, you can maintain in the post-operative period. Whereas uh, you, when I used to use a DHS or a single screw device like a gamma, the minute you release traction, the thing started to shorten. And you see the post-op x-rays, they had already settled. These, mm -hmm. these fractures don't, if, if it's done the way I'm uh, describing, they don't settle. So all these studies, it's challenging to have, you know, long-term follow-up in these geriatric hip fracture patients for a number of reasons. The mortality is high. Um, the follow-up rates were a little bit low at one year in the study, more so in the intertan group. Um, do you feel that these patients really need to be followed that long to show a difference? Um, do you feel as though the outcomes would have been different if they were followed for a year? Yeah, so um, I actually don't think uh, so, but uh, what I would say is there there have been a number of studies, and uh, in my role as editor-in-chief of the Journal of Orthopedic Trauma, I see a lot of manuscripts. So there's a manuscript <clears throat> that I've seen uh, where they uh, look at these patients and follow them and see if there's any change in their radiographic uh, outcomes uh, at, uh, you know, three weeks, six weeks, uh, 12 weeks, uh, three months, well, it's 12 weeks, <laughs> and, and, and six months and a year. And really after the global period, after uh, 90 days, there's not much change uh, in patients with hip fractures. Uh, either it fails catastrophically within the global period or it just kind of uh, heals. There, is a sm there was a small subsection of those patients that kind of didn't quite heal from the three to six month, but uh, I mean, there was virtually no change uh, after six months. And what happens with these patients, the really infirmed ones, uh, is that they don't want to leave the nursing home or their home to come to the doctor for not yet another a visit if they're doing okay. And then obviously some of them die. Some of them are just wheelchair bound for other medical reasons. So you do get a lot of uh, loss. So uh, this paper seems to indicate that after uh, uh, three months, but certainly after six months, there's no change in the outcomes. So I think we're getting to that point with this particular fracture where we're gonna expect a minimum of six months, but not a minimum of a year. So, and we usually see, I mean, if there's a catastrophic failure, which is rare, we see that uh, it's usually within the first 90 days. So, so failures beyond six months, pretty rare. Yeah. Um, so the study specifically compared the intertan to gamma three. Um, there are other devices out there that, for instance, have a, a helical blade or even some devices that have two screws that aren't integrated. Uh, do you think there would have been any change in outcomes if any other devices were utilized or not really? So. Um, I would say uh, most of the data on the helical blade uh, indicates that it uh, ends up having problems in certain types of fractures, and it depends on which fracture and how it's placed. Uh, I would say that two screws that are uh, like we uh, used to have, a, we used to use a recon nail for some of these fractures in the past, you know, two non-integrated screws, but those two screws can, can rotate uh, around each other, even though they're locked in the nail, they still can cycle. And so that uh, is what happens. And so they end up failing as well. It's always a race. Um, the, the thing about the inner tan is that it's actually, um, you get about 17 millimeters of a screw fixation in this head and neck. Uh, and it's towards the calcar. So it really prevents rotation, and then you get compression, which no other system gets and maintains. So it's a very different um, biomechanical way of fixing the fracture. Um, but you know that said, you have to spend time reducing the fracture. The very basic orthopedics, 
And when I was a resident, these people would get thrown up on, you know, <laughs> thrown up on a, a, a fracture table. You know, somebody would put a DHS in and try to get done in 12 minutes and then get the patient off to get them back so they could get the patient out of bed. But that was about all they were trying to do. And uh, honestly, now I live in Florida. We have a lot of uh, retirees who are osteopenic, but very active. They live at home. They play golf. They play pickleball. They do all sorts of things. They break their hip. They don't want to end up uh, really being limited and having subsequent problems. Now, of course, that happens in any case. But uh, what we've found is it's been pretty remarkable, even with uh, four-part inotropes, that you're able to get them to heal, not shorten, uh, and not medialize. And uh, that's really just the way the construct has developed. But the most important thing is to spend the time in the operating room reducing the fracture, just like you would do any other fracture. You don't need to just throw the patient. You know, when I was a, 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 a fellow, the deal was, you know, you want to slam a gamma in grandma. And that's just not the way we treat these fractures anymore. So take them into the operating room, get an anatomic reduction. Don't be afraid to put in a hook, do the things you have to do. And then once it's anatomic and you can maintain it, when you put in the device, uh, then with at least with our device, you get compression and then you lock it. You maintain the anatomy that you had uh, in your reduction. And then you, you'll see that post-op without any really settling if you lock it at the top. Great, thanks. So more, so the, the device might be superior, but need to have a good reduction regardless of which device. Regardless, yes. Uh, were there any unexpected findings from the study at all that you did or kind of expected? Uh, not in that uh, study. Uh, we, you know, we use Tracy Watson's technique of uh, measuring so that uh, we uh, adjust it for the magnification. So I think that was pretty accurate. We subsequently, uh, uh, I think, presented a paper at the OTA, and we're in the middle of publishing that now, where we looked at four-part inotropes uh, that uh, are uh, that use the inotan where we lock it. And if you have a gap, and there's actually been another paper that's come across my desk where the problem with all these fractures is if you have a gap and you lock statically on the top and statically on the bottom, then that gap can never settle. And if the gap doesn't settle, then occasionally the nail can break. And that's whether it's a femoral nail for a femoral shaft fracture, just a standard subtrope, or whether you're doing an intertrope. So uh, I would say that, especially with our nailing system, if you're going to lock up top to maintain that fixation, you need to probably put it in a dynamic mode distally so you prevent rotation and you'll lose maybe a quarter, you know, two, three, four, five millimeters but that'll allow it to collapse. Don't forget, don't forget the basics. You have to take traction off, right? You have to make sure that the fracture is reduced, like basic orthopedic trauma surgery. The implant is not gonna solve all your problems, right? It just helps, uh, but you still have to pay attention to basic uh, training. So Great. compress your fractures. Um, run out of time a little bit, but so, you know, some people that may be listening to this talk, they may be limited in what they can use with their hospital systems, and they may want to use a two-screw device, but they're only allowed to use it for certain fracture patterns or a limited number of cases. So for those those people, um, are there any patterns that you think this, this device is uh, best suited for or any that they sure. should use it in? I or think any that, uh, yeah, it? I think that uh, unstable inotrochs, three and four-part inotrochs, uh, or uh, really, this is the, the major benefit for that. And I also know that almost every <clears throat> um, uh, contract that a hospital has, it's for 90%. Uh, and they allow 10% uh, to bring in a, a separate device. Uh, so if you're going to use this device and bring it in for a special fracture, uh, I would say use it for the four, three or four part inotropes that are uh, unstable. And the data from uh, Canada uh, that won the Boval Award from David Sanders and his group uh, actually showed that uh, they, they had much better results on the inner tropes that were unstable, even in younger patients, uh, when they used the inner TAM. So uh, this device is unique. Uh, I'm very proud to have been part of the development of this with Tony Russell uh, and the engineers, uh, but um, basically, 
uh, where it's going to show you the most advantage is in uh, unstable inotropes. Are there any patterns that you think it wouldn't be good, wouldn't be suited for, or any any um, patterns that that you did tend to see some failures in? No, the only only thing with an it's just with a nail in general, right? So if you have an inotrope that breaks right through the uh, um, trochanteric fossa there, uh, where the nail comes in, you have to be careful that you don't kick it into varus. And then obviously, if the lesser if the greater troch is broken and you have a greater troch escape, you need to uh be aware of that and protect against that and sometimes for those difficult cases you need to add a hook plate but that's for everybody's uh device um so that they don't get that uh trope escape great all right well thank you for your time i really appreciate it and for uh your insight into not only study but but obviously the device itself right okay well thank you very much i enjoyed it all right uh great interviews we'll get the moderators and our uh, guest faculty on and uh, we'll be taking questions from the question box, but also uh, kind of tossing around some questions from the moderators to our authors. So, um, Dr. Ewan, I wanted to ask you a question and then see what Dr. Sanders' thoughts are. Um, all three videos talked about the importance of the basics, reduction, tip to apex distance. You know, the implant doesn't solve the problem, it helps you. So how do you think the audience and the learners uh, on tonight should interpret the three studies we just listened to and apply them to their practice uh, as long as they're following the basics? Yeah, that's a good question. I think it, it comes down to like, there's there's big mistakes that you can make and there's small adjustments, you know, the um, and you certainly don't want to get caught in the weeds of minutia about treating intertrochanteric fractures and different devices and ignore the most important things about treating an intertrochanteric fracture surgically. So I think that the one good message from all of those studies is that you got to get the fracture reduced. You can't leave it in varus and you got to get the, the primary screw that you're using deep and central in the head. And if you do that, then it's going to be hard to lose with most fractures. The rest then is, is a little bit more subtle about analyzing the exact pattern or how unstable is the pattern and what particular type of device you're going to use for that. But if you don't get those things right. It doesn't matter what you're using. It's gonna you're gonna have a problem. Dr. Sanders, what do you uh, what do you think? <clears throat> uh, yeah, I think much like uh, much like the advice that was just given, you know, the the principles haven't changed for a long time, and they won't change in the future. Um, the new devices available to us are are interesting and useful, <clears throat> uh, but I think if you, if you take away the like you said the reduction the screw fixation. Uh, and then you blend in what's the complexity of the fracture. Then maybe you start making educated decisions about when you need different style implants. So it's some combination of the fracture and the device. Uh, and if you understand both of them in a sensible manner, you can you can choose the right combination of them to get the result you want. Awesome. Uh, Nick, I saw you had a question from the audience. Uh, yeah, so one question from the audience, maybe uh, Dr. Sanders and Yuan could start, uh, would be, uh, they were curious in the results of uh, using PMMA for the lag screw. Um, yeah, I, I don't have much experience using it. I do have some opinions on it, but why don't you guys go ahead first? Do you, have you used it at all? Um, do you have any thoughts on its use? I have used it only in the revision setting. I have not used it in a primary setting. And the, and the thought there, of course, just being is that the fixation of the device that I'm putting into the head is probably compromised to some degree or another because there's been a, a device already in there. And then perhaps interdigitating some cement through the through the screw into the cancellous bone that's left remaining might improve the stability of it, but I haven't used it for primary fixation. Have you had to revise any that have had it in there? I have. How'd that go? I, have, I haven't had a problem breaking the bond. In fact, I, the, the couple that I've done, I've had it, it's almost unsettlingly easy to break the bond between the screw. I haven't done it with a helical blade, maybe taking that, but with the, between the screw and the cement making you wonder about how much it actually was adding to it, but I haven't had any problems removing it. Dr. Sanders. Almost the exact same answer. Um, I've, I've also tried it in the setting of tumor, which uh, I found to be especially problematic. Uh, you know, pathologic intertroch fractures, probably the, the areas where I've seen fails, failures more commonly. I think it's just decreased capacity to heal, but I agree with Brandon's answer completely. Now, one thing that I've heard of happening to at least one person was that someone penetrated the femoral head 
with the guide wire and maybe the reamer a little bit. And they injected the cement and then there's cement in the joint. So that's one thing that makes me scared working with residents all the time, like you guys do too. Uh, that, that That's one thing that scares me. I, I was more concerned about the revision you know, I had one this past week that I revised to a blade plate and what if I couldn't get all that cement out of there and get a blade in there. So those types of things just concern me about it. I don't know, but what uh, Jillian or, or Dr. Hagedorn, what do you guys think about it? Um, I've, I've used it uh, in four part interviews before. Uh, and when I say use it, um, actually placing the cement has only happened a handful of times because uh, I, I run contrast up into the the sleeve until I inject the cement. And if there's any hint that the contrast is not going to, is, is outside the fracture in the joint, I just abandon the cement portion of it. So I think it's a good tool. Uh, but I think much like Dr. Roy Sanders said, um, reduction and the tool is not going to solve the problem. It's just going to help you. And I think that's another example uh, of that. Dr. Casey, you have any input? Uh, only limited experience. Uh, I think as someone said, I think revision was the only one as far as just filling a deficit so that you get some purchase with your uh, new screw that you're going to use. Next question was, any indication for intermediate nails? Anyone utilizing those routinely? Yeah, so I, I have a comment about that. And hopefully, maybe, I'll, maybe I can start some discussion with the rest of you to see what your thoughts are on this. As my, one of my partners has said that something, something slightly controversial about intermediate nails. But I mean, I, I think that uh, I don't use it often, but I think it may have a indication for the fracture pattern that you'd otherwise be very comfortable using a short nail in, but the patient has a very wide open, large canal where a short nail is going to be toggling back and forth inside the proximal femur. And so you'd say that, well, maybe you don't need the, frac the nail to go all the way down to the distal femur. Maybe you just need it to go into the isthmus and lock it short would be just fine. So then the obvious next question to that would be is there any indication to use a short nail should you just all should they all be intermediate nails right if you're just doing that should you just put an intermediate nail in every single one and should you have some have to have some sort of justification or reason why you're not using an intermediate nail and you're using a short nail i don't know the answer to that but i'm curious what you guys think I can tackle this one. I've got a very, uh, I've got a very specific patient in mind when I think of an intermediate nail. It's often someone in whom the fracture pattern is unstable, and I would like a long nail, but their femoral anatomy is not conducive to it. Usually, diminutive women, certain heritage groups, and you say a long nail would be really nice, but you you do the math, you put the guide wire down, and you're going to perforate the cortex a couple centimeters above the patella. So there, I think an intermediate nail is a very attractive option. It gets you more distal purchase in theory, but it's not so long that you're going to talk about perforating the anterior cortex. So that's where I think it's useful. Yeah, I agree with Dr. Sanders. And, and I've had some weird ones, and you guys probably have too, where there was maybe some hardware distally that just you didn't want to take out, maybe a fracture that was incompletely healed distally. And the intermediate nail often that gives an advantage for some of those things that allow some overlap of the implants. Yeah, I get I get cautious when you talk about intermediate nails, and maybe I'm on the other side of this. I'm a I'm a short or a long guy when it comes down to it. And the my reasoning is is that there's a lot of uh, design flaws with the initial inter, uh, cephalomedullary nails, and one of them was the length at which it ended. It was it was also a little bit too long in addition to the valgus angle and the steel nature of it. So um, I try, you know. Um, you do get, get those patients where the anatomy just doesn't allow you to get it um, distal. And I think you can manipulate, and I do manipulate the guide wire and get that distal to the patella. Uh, it does take extra time. I could probably get an intermediate or short nail down sooner, but uh, because of that fracture risk and kind of the things that we saw in the 90s with these initial designs, I try to, I try to stay away from them and go one direction or the other. I think I think I'm team short or long as well. So I agree with you on that. Um, I think the one time I think uh, there's also, you know, I think if their distal geometry is such that you can't pass it, I guess that would be the only indication to to do the intermediate nail. But like you said, there's there's ways around it unless you're fighting it uh, and you're not able to do it. I think short or longs probably your answer. Okay. Um, question about basic cervical fractures and patterns. 
that extend into the neck. How do you deal with those? Do you guys change up your implant at all if you have a fracture that goes more into the neck? Um, any other considerations when you have fractures such as that? I think if we're sticking, yeah, if we're sticking purely to the geriatric fractures, it, it doesn't really change my approach. I mean, you get these these odd in between fracture patterns, and you're deciding between replacement or internal fixation. Uh, I think you kind of either you pick one or the other. You say I'm going to dive in the deep end and replace it, or I'm going to repair it. And if it's a geriatric fracture, I'm I'm a believer that the geriatric nails are are built better for those fracture patterns that have that large proximal body, large diameter lag screws. Um, obviously, as the fracture extends more into the neck and doesn't involve the trochanteric region, maybe a replacement is is more palatable. Uh, but I know the my joints partners don't like doing replacements when the trochanters are involved, you know, it increases the complexity, blood loss, risk of post-op complications, things like that. So I think for the right patient, um, a little involvement of the neck is still going to fix it, uh, especially when it's in combination with any sort of combination in the trochanteric line. Yeah, I agree. I do a lot of hip arthroplasty and we have those comminuted ones that come in and have a bad neck fracture. And I just tell them to nail them all and let the trochial. It's such an easier reconstruction later on. Sorry, Dr. Yuan, were you going to say something? No, no, that was, I, that's an excellent point. I, I think the one that's more challenging is the one that's a relatively simple fracture that's like right at the intertrochanteric line where it's like, is, is this really an, an extracapsular or an intracapsular fracture? And I think there's Good data, including a relatively smaller study out of Dick Kyle's group that said that if you nail those ones, they tend to do actually relatively poorly with a with a nail in it. Those are ones that I think, even as being someone that has a tendency to use a lot of nails and less screw and side plate devices, I would use a screw and side plate device for the simple fracture pattern that you can't, you know, is right at that cutoff between being intra and extra capsular. I think the problem, likely the main issue there is that those ones, in my experience, tend to spin a lot more when you put a device into the head and it's much more difficult to maintain a good reduction percutaneously with those. And if you're using a screwed and side plate device through the same exposure, it's very easy just to reach your finger up right, you know, over there in front of the abductors and feel the reduction as you're putting the, the whatever device you are into the head and make sure that the reduction is still um, anatomic. Do you limit their weight bearing at all? If, they're, if it's kind of almost going into like a transcervical neck with the basic cervical, would you limit them at all postoperatively using a side plate and screw or still just the only brace tolerated? If it's a geriatric, uh, you know, hip fracture at all, for, almost regardless of what I do for it or, or, or what the pattern was, I'm letting a weight bear is tolerated. So one, one consideration we didn't discuss and some, some people are talking about this is for the stable intertrochanteric fracture pattern that you put a cephalomedullary nail in to hold your reduction, do you need to supply a distal interlock? And so are, are we locking every time, uh, Dr. Ewan and Dr. Sanders, or is there exceptions to that? Yeah, I'm locking can, it every time. Yeah, I agree. I agree with Brandon. Uh, and uh, it's interesting. I, I trained uh, where I work now with a bunch of people who they were believers in the long unlock nail for even stable patterns. But I have to say, I became convinced, you know, there were three, your study was prospective, but there were three good retrospective studies. Uh, Connor Cluno did one, the guys at Fresno did one. And the conclusions there, their fractures around long nails were new trauma around unlocked nails. So it wasn't a lot of them, but I became a believer that you should probably lock all of them. So now, now I lock all of them long and short. Uh, we touched on it a little bit briefly in uh, Dr. Yuan's article, just the question asking about considerations for periprosthetic fractures, length or size, like length or diameter of nail. Um, do you guys have any thoughts on, would you rather deal with a shaft or distal fracture, or do you not worry about that at all? I think I think there's no doubt if you just said it's a fracture around a supplementary nail, I and I don't get to see any x-rays. I'm hoping it's a fracture in the isthmus below a short nail because I can just change yeah. that to a long nail, right? Mm -hmm. um, the more It's more difficult to treat the fracture around the distal end of a long nail, in my opinion. Those tend to be more accommodated. Sometimes the nails, you know, out the front of the femur, there's, I think those are tend to be more challenging. Um, the real question, of course, is, well, are you, is it really one for one, right? Or is it, is it, are you, is it equal risk of a fracture below the short nail versus the fracture below the long nail? And I think with modern implants and, and, John alluded to this a little bit, but with modern implants, we maybe don't exactly know if that's true or not. Um, 
we got into that a little bit with the discussion of the article, but the with the small study that we had, which wasn't powered to answer that question, we didn't see a difference between them. And, and frankly, both of the fractures that occurred in in that study, we, in the real short nails, we treated non-operatively. There were small non-displaced cracks in the femur that occurred from new trauma and we treated them non-operatively and they healed. And both of the ones around long nails were fractures that required open reduction internal fixation that are relatively challenging. So um, is anyone using the sliding hip screw with a side plate anymore? And does that have an indication in either of your practices? For for geriatric intertoe yeah. fractures, I don't I don't use it. You know, I had some experience with it as a, a trainee and some time overseas using it a lot, but in practice, I don't use it at all. We've gone exclusively to CM nails. I have used it uh, very rarely for the surprise intraoperative finding of of an unstable pattern or something that that I didn't appreciate preoperatively, which. I try to make sure that it doesn't happen to me preoperatively, but it has happened to me once or twice. Um, I would say I, I, I tend toward the, the short nail, um, but also, especially with those true, like only found on MRI inner trochs, clearly stable. Um, I think it's good to still have that skill set. So I try and do them on all of those um, because like you said, if you find um, an inner op one and they have that high vertical neck, um, I think it's still good to have that skill set and not be only using that when you're trying to also get your neck reduced above it and be the first time you've used the DH test in a few years. So there's a question from the audience, uh, Dr. Ewan, about did your study demonstrate any difference in the neck shaft angle healing position between long and short nails? Um, did you notice anything about that? Um no, we didn't. The uh, one thing that we did notice, this is, and this study is in review right now, but just the, we did go back and look at the amount that the fracture collapsed and correlated that with their functional outcomes and did see that the more that the lag screw slid there, it did actually correlate with their SF36 scores at three months postoperatively, which is maybe not surprising. There's been other data, of course, for femoral neck fractures that have shown the same thing, that the more the anatomy changes as it heals, it does affect their functional outcome. Um, that being said, between long and short nails, we didn't have a significant difference in the amount that the lag screw slid, nor did we have a difference in healing rates between long and short nails. Uh, there's a, a question that specifically talks about the inner tan, but I mean, maybe others have seen this happen with other devices. If the neck shaft angle of the device is less than that of the native femur, uh, have you seen any fractures pulled in the varus when you're compressing? Has anyone had that happen? Uh, I can tackle that. I, I can't say I've seen it result from the compression screw. I think the, the varus malreduction, it comes from the wedging of the fracture. You know, the, the start point with respect to the fracture line uh, the type of reamer you use. There's a there's a really nice JOT article about what wedge effect. It was like Hobie Summers wrote it a couple of years ago. Just like technical tricks, how to avoid that. You know, it's the the reason the sliding hip screw is so appealing is you're going perpendicular to the fracture. Obviously, when your fixation is going in the same plane of your fracture, it gets really tricky. So I think it can be done during the preparation of the canal and the insertion of the nail. I personally have not had the experience of the insertion of the lag screws inducing a deformity. So I think if you if you set it up well and prepare the channel nail, prepare the channel well for the nail, you won't experience that. And then there's another question from the audience about the uh, neck shaft angle of their cephalomedullary device. Um, does that play a role? Uh, do you use that as a consideration when you're choosing your device based on fracture pattern or? Are you just kind of a one angle person, you know, 125, 130 every time? I almost exclusively use a 130 device um, for, and I'm more likely to use it the more unstable the pattern um, appears to be. My rationale for doing that is that basically as I, you know, the what, two mistakes I don't want to make is I don't want to malreduce the fracture, particularly malreduce it in varus. And I don't want to, I don't want to put the screw deep in central. So as if I'm putting the screw deep in central and it's a 130 angle device, then it's very unlikely that I've reduced that fracture in varus. And as somebody else told me once, you know, our uh, valgus is like Christmas. You can never have too much of it in intertroid fractures, right? You want to just get the thing out of varus. You might mistake you don't want to make is to leave that thing in varus. So I don't mind mal-reducing it a little bit in valgus. 
I mean, me, I look at their other side and just kind of measure the next shaft angle kind of visually. Um, and I'll, I'll pick a 125 if they have a lot of varus, just because I'm concerned that uh, the screw may end up a little high in the head. But I've used that, like Dr. Yuan kind of talked about, to induce some valgus into fractures that I thought were in a little bit of varus before we put the screw in. Has anyone seen any fractures around intermediate nails? That was kind of one question here. Probably just not enough of them out there to see it, I'm guessing. That's my experience, yeah, and it's not enough of them. I mean, the, mod, the, more, the newer ones are sided, you know, right and left and bowed. And so, you know, the concern about it being uh, impinging against the anterior cortex should be less with that. But I, those are, that's a lot of unanswered questions, I think, around intermediate nails. Uh, There's a question about non-unions. I don't know how much you want to talk about this. Um, what's your preferred technique for management of a, I mean, it's usually the subtro component of a um, rather common user fracture. Um, do you guys have any, any go-tos that you usually typically use for those? I think when you're in the revision situation, you usually want to use something with a different fixation pattern, you know, to get, to get you may use a recon style nail, especially if it's a subtroke fracture, kind of back to the question, are you going to fill the void with, uh, you know, calcium cement or even a PMMA? So I think these are really exceptional circumstances. It depends on where the non-union is, what anatomic location, but in general, if you're going to do a revision fixation, you need something with a different, different screw configuration. Uh, one more question about using a DHS. If, if you see somebody who might need a total hip, do you think it's better to do a DHS over a nail? I think so. I think there's there's some literature to support that they are relatively the same when you convert them from nail um, or side plate uh, to then a total hip. But I think in having done those procedures as well, the injury to, to their abductors from the nail is definitely way more significant. Um, Versus when you're having a DHS, you know, have a, you have pristine abductors, and you kind of pretty much once you take the DHS out, you can do your total hip from the front or the back, and really your your incision kind of is out of your way, and um, your your muscle plane is kind of the same. So, so one of the considerations, uh, and this relates to a question that was just asked in the chat, is that uh, Dr. Roy Sanders talked about compressing the screw and then locking it as a fixed angled device uh, in his interview. And so uh, this question that was asked is, do you have to lock all these nails as fixed angled devices, or is there a role to allow for uh, a version of controlled collapse where the compression can happen without rotation of the fractures? So um, I don't know what the panel thinks about that. I mean, I think the ideal situation is you want it, you want it compressed in the anatomic position, right? And then held there for sure. But then you're doing a percutaneous reduction of a lot of, uh, of these types of injuries, then you're not always going to get in there comminuted. You're not always going to get perfect anatomic alignment of the two pieces together and having some settling of it is going to be advantageous in the post operative period for healing, for getting the parts to compress together to heal. The real, you know, the question I have about that is that what about, you know, for devices that are not the inner tan, does locking, quote unquote, the, the lag screw in place with the set screw actually keep it from sliding or not? You know, you, uh, it's hard to imagine that, you know, just you can turn that set screw as tight as you want. I'm, I've had experience with always the, the, sets, the lag screw sliding a little bit in the post-operative period if there's not bone contact uh, at the fracture site. Yeah, I think every, everyone can point to examples of of screw constructs that have been locked and failed. And like you said, it's usually in the context of a deficient reduction. So, I mean, I'm, I'm of the opinion with Intertan, if you've, if you've made the decision to use Intertan and you've used it sensibly, you should lock it. And the question about, do you lock it tight? Yeah, absolutely. You wanna hear the titanium squeak. Um, I think the whole point is to try and prevent it from moving, but it's obviously, it's some combination of your reduction, your fixation, right? Just because you lock the screw tight, if you have a very poor reduction, it's going to fail over time. The patient's going to overpower it. All right. So we have a, a few minutes left here. Um, thank you for all the questions and everything uh, that we've covered tonight. Um, any final questions from uh, Dr. Romeo or Dr. Kaisley? We got through most of mine just through the uh, questions from the uh, attendees. Okay. 
Uh, the mm -hmm. one thing, um, what about, uh, do you guys ever open them and reduce them? How frequently do you open a geriatric pertro to reduce? Like, I mean, fully open it, visualize fracture and everything. Almost never, mostly percutaneous, I assume. Yeah, I'd say almost never. I think for the for the young high energy intertroch, I almost prepare myself to open most, if not all of them. Uh, but for the geriatric fractures, it's the opposite. Is anyone nailing that he's lateral? Any geriatric ones lateral? Yeah, I do we do all of them lateral? D files on the fracture table, but I actually just had to do one lateral the other day because I had a plate below. But all right, any uh any final thoughts, Dr. Sanders or Dr. Ewan? No, I don't think so. I think that was great. Thanks for having me on tonight. I think it's very nice to hear everyone's thoughts about something you know that we've uh, addressed or thought or potentially addressed in the past and get everyone's input on on this. I think it's true that it's not totally solved this problem with the interterconteric fractures for sure, but it's certainly something that in my short career has definitely a pendulum has swung one direction to another from you know using screw and side plate devices to using mostly cephalomedullary nails. So it's something that's definitely changing for sure. Yeah, I agree with exactly what Brandon said. Even short period, a lot has changed. The technology has advanced. Uh, so it's exciting to see it in practice and, and what the future might hold. All right. Well, thank you, everyone, for coming out tonight in the audience. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sanders, Dr. Ewan, Dr. Rom uh, Romero, and Kaisley. And uh, thanks again to the AO staff. Everyone have a great evening and a great holidays.